That's my wake up call. Well going everybody. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga show episode number 144 with me your host Agostino Zinga. How you doing? How you feeling? Huh? How you feeling? Do the old D W It's me, 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 me. Hope you guys are doing well. Well rested, well hydrated, well lubricated, and you got your mobility in in you know, peak optimal operation, and you're feeling good, huh? What's happening, man? What's cracker lacking? We're slowly hurtling towards the middle of January, if we're not already in the middle of January. How are you keeping up with those New Year's Eve resolutions, huh? Huh? Have they gone by the wayside? Have you fallen off the wagon? Have you have you thought, you know what? Fuck it, there's no point of change because we don't change as human beings because the state of the culture around us is changing consistently and we cannot keep up forward motion going through the things that we're going through. Whatever excuse you have, Put it by the by, lay it aside, get back on the wagon, man. I've my message tools, you now. We're in the middle of the month, right? You still got 15 or so days left for you to kind of resurrect or to kind of rescue whatever resolution you had in plan or you had in mind. Grab it by the scruff of the neck and try again. Don't let this year pass you by going through the same old things you did last year. And if you are going to do that, I don't want to hear you fucking complaining. That's my only thing, all right? I'm all for people taking it easy, right? I mentioned yesterday, like, I don't, you know, I've come to understand that the older I got, the more I've understood that maybe just some people just can't be bothered, right? And it's okay to not be bothered. It's okay to just think, you know what? I just want to skirt through life doing the um, minimum, the, the, what you call it? Um, the bare minimum in order to kind of make sure that I have a roof over my head, I'm fully clothed and I have food in my belly. People just want to live life simply, plainly, without any stress. I understand that. But what I don't understand is those people who want to live life that way, but then have ambitions of living life, um, you know, a couple of levels above what they're living at the moment, right? They want an increase in their salary. They want to live in a better space. They want to have a, be- uh, a I don't know, cooler social group of friends. They want to wear the finest linens, whatever it may be, right? But they're, at, but you know, their work doesn't match their ambition and that's the only thing that annoys me about that thing and that usually breeds people who are always whining and complaining about stuff oh, i don't know how could she do that how did he get there nah, 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 nah. whining and whining and fucking mo- woe is me sort of person what you gotta do with your woe and whatever it is whatever you're envious of or you're jealous about you have to analyze who they are look at what they're doing regardless of how shitty you may think it is regardless of how you may think you might do better and you have to extrapolate take two steps backwards and think okay how did they get where they had to get to who's i don't know who's asked that they had to lick who's who did they have to beg for an internship who did whatever whatever it may be break it down and then see how much of the steps you've actually done if you haven't done jack shit stop complaining Stop complaining. And like I said, January is a, January should be a month where no one should complain. I think January should be a month where everyone should feel quite good about themselves because you've got like a free, you've got a blank slate. You've got an opportunity to start all over again. You should be feeling like, you know what? Regards to what may happen in the past, I have an opportunity now to set things straight and to get back on the, on the wagon and to get things started again. That's how January should feel like. So regardless of where you are on your path, Put those things aside and start again. It's okay. No no one minds. Don't wait until Monday like, like most people do. Don't do that thing. Just start now. If you fucked up at two, start again at three. That kind of thinking. Have that. Get back on the wagon as soon as possible. And I guarantee you, by the end of January, look how much better you'll feel, man. Look how much better you'll feel. Imagine if you promise yourself you won't be drinking this month and you had a little cheeky drink yesterday. Cool. Let's just start from today, man. Let's start from today and not be drinking. You know, and how much better would you feel that you've got 15 or so days under your belt? Or you got ten days, or you got five days, then you can just build again from February. That is my um, that's my advice. I'd say anyway. That's how I find things easier. But again, what the fuck do I know, eh? What do I know? Um. Anyway, welcome back to the show. It's been a fairly hectic morning as per usual. My mornings are usually my most busiest and most strenuous times because it, it requires me having to wake up before most people get to work and having to go to the gym before most people get to work in order to come back home so I can get to work myself. So um. There's always a, you know, the most busiest time in my day is usually in the morning, sometime before, you know, 6 and 9 a.m. I have to kind of get everything kind of done. So um, the stresses and strains of life kind of, you know, pile onto my shoulder blades. But um, so far, so good. I just got back from the gym, did a little hour workout there um, on top of the three mile run I did on Monday. So I'm feeling kind of tight. Actually, when I woke up in the morning, my hips were a little bit tight. It could be old age. It could be the fact that I didn't warm up prior. But I was like, oh, 
I felt like I should just like not go to the gym today. But luckily, I think over the years, because of just like constantly badgering or running into brick walls and stabbing my toes onto curbs and um, not be able to catch a barber probably and have it to snatch across your arms or dropping a weight on your toes, constant just you know, abuse in the gym and all sort of physical activities has finally got me to a place where I kind of feel like working out has kind of, it's on the same level as brushing my teeth now at the moment. You know, like, um, no one really enjoys brushing their teeth, right? No one gets up in the morning and like, oh, I can't wait to brush my teeth. Or at night before bed, I can't wait to brush my teeth after a meal, right? No one's actually looking forward to it, right? And if you are, you're weirdo, right? For the most part, I don't think anyone, like, you know, um, has a big part of their day of like, oh, I can't wait to brush my teeth before breakfast. I, f- I love the, the feel of toothpaste on my, off my, on my rusty teeth. No one really thinks of that, right? So for the most part, we just do it because of pure necessity. And I think I've reached that stage with the gym or working out. I reached that stage where I've kindly started to realize that um, I used to be under the false assumption or illusion that I actually enjoyed working out, that it was one of the big big part of my days of overcoming my fears, all that sort of fucking hyperbolic bullshit. But once I look at it in just its pure, you know, black and white um, sense and surface level of what exactly it is and the kind of results it gets me, it allows me to physically um, exert, you know, some sort of stresses and strains in my body, which I kind of do enjoy. It allows me to maintain or to lose weight in order to make sure I fit into my clothes, which is the main thing right and also it frames a big part of my day usually whenever i don't work out in the morning my day usually goes a little bit sluggish i feel a little bit lethargic i don't feel like i feel like i got that weird foggy haze from waking up um that just consistently stays with me uh, probably up after into lunch especially if i eat carbs at lunch i feel even more even more um foggy so if anything i feel the workout has kind of allowed me to kind of get rid of that morning fog right get clear it all up and let myself feel a little bit nice in the morning but essentially, it is kind of up there with brushing my teeth. I just do it because my body is now being conditioned to the sense of, you know, when the morning comes. Um, part of my shower routine is tied into working out, right? I work out first in the morning and I'm like, come back, I shower and get ready to go to work. So the times I don't do that, right, and I just wake up and have a shower in the morning, it feels weird. Like, it feels like, you know, usually whenever I'm getting to shower, I'm getting to shower after I've worked out an hour or, or plus and I'm fucking drenched in sweat and I'm having to like, slowly scrub myself because all my body is aching and stuff from working out. So I've even, it's even tied to that. It's even tied to my um, breakfast um, time schedule-wise because I don't really have that much time after I come back, wash, shower, do a podcast, have breakfast and go. There's not much time to kind of sit down and enjoy it. So when I'm not working out and I've saved that hour and I'm actually sitting down, I'm like, oh, I've still got an hour and a half to go it feels weird so all in all it's all kind of deeply tied into my kind of day and what i do um which is kind of which has been good actually I, i'm happy i've got to that place because now it's not something i have to kind of push myself to do i just do it because you know i have to do it so it's simple as that um, and that's been a revelation that's been um, very interesting to me these past um few weeks but apart from that feel pretty good did some weight training came back um and yeah here, here we are episode number 144 man let's get this bad boy started and before we get this bad boy started i've been reading um again because you know every year is the same old thing you continue reading books this year i read over what was it 34 37 books in the year which was quite good um a little bit below my target i wanted to get to last um that i set last year which i think was 42 but i kind of roughly read about an average of three books a month which is still quite decent um i'm gonna start again buying my books for the year in february I'm kind of uh, going through some of the books I haven't finished from the last year and kind of finishing them until the end of the month. And then I've got books to start in February. I've got a couple that I'm listening to, actually, new books. Um, I've got two. I've got On Writing by Stephen King that, I find that I've got now on um, Books app that I'm currently reading now. Let me get up here so I'll show you, even though my screen is all fucked up. Um, we've got it here. So I've got On Writing by Stephen King. It's here on the, on the camera, if you can see it. Look how matched up my screen looks. But anyway... On writing by Stephen King, I'm starting to read that now. Um, and then the other books that I've got that I'm reading at the moment is um, Can't Hurt Me, an autobiography by David Goggins, who's been on the Joe Rogan podcast a few times, former Navy SEAL. He's got this book called um, Can't Hurt Me, which is available now. So I've got dozen audio books, but the rest I'm reading now. In terms of books I haven't read during the last year, but this is one book that I've kind of come back to again, and again, and again. Something I bought a, a while ago, I think when it came out, 2017 maybe, by Ryan Holiday, um, formerly known of uh, The Obstacles Away, and he's got this amazing book too called Conspiracy, which I finished on audiobook, 
which kind of details the whole uh, Hulk Hogan v. Gorka debacle that eventually um, sent Gorka down. But he's got this book called The Daily Stoic, which is um, 366 Meditations on wis Wisdom, Perseverance, and the Art of Living. Um, so it it's effectively like a daily philosophy um, kind of handbook that you can kind of read um, each day, sort of like marked out. There you see like the dates all marked out on there. Some bits I've highlighted. So you kind of flick through the page. Okay, I'm on the screen there. You flick through the page of the, of the corresponding date and then you kind of read the kind of philosophy that he's kind of extracted. They're usually stoic philosophy based on the works of uh, Seneca, Epicedes, and Marcus Aurelius. And um, obviously January it being the kind of start of the new year and you trying to get things back in order and new year's resolution, all that sort of stuff. It's probably the strongest part of the book because I've kind of I basically highlighted literally every other page of it, right? And today um, was something that kind of, um, today is something that kind of resonated a lot to me. Um, today's passage, so I'll re quickly read this in the Daily Stoic on January 15th and I'll talk a little bit about it. So on January 15th, um, the title of this is Peace is, Peace is in staying the course right <clears throat> and this is a quote from seneca right and it says uh tranquility can be grasped except by those can't be grasped except by those who reached an unwavering and firm power of judgment the rest constantly fall and rise in their decisions wavering in a state of alternative alternately rejecting and accepting things what is the course of this back and forth um, it's because nothing is clear and they rely on the most uncertain guide common opinion and uh, the and the, the the section continues with Ryan Sen uh, Ryan Holiday's um, commentary. It says here, in Seneca's essay on tranquility, he uses the Greek word um, euph euphemia, which defines as believing in yourself and trusting that you are on the right path, not being in doubt by following a myriad of footsteps um, of those wandering in every directions. It is in this state of mind he says that produces tranquility. Clarity of vision as well allows us to have this belief. That's not to say that we're always going to be 100% certain of everything or that we should be. Rather, it's that we rest assured that we're heading generally in the right direction, that we don't convey, that we don't constantly compare ourselves with others and change our mind every three seconds based on new information. Instead, tranquility and peace are found in identifying our path and in sticking to it, staying the course and making adjustments here and there naturally by ignoring the distractions and sirens um, who beckon us towards them. And this is something that kind of resonated a lot with me um, over the last few days because obviously, you know, I've, I've had probably, an, I've had an interesting week in emails and stuff and replies back, but it just kind of got me thinking. I'm fastly approaching the one year anniversary of me uh, DJing at the Heathcote and Star for my night called La Betis, which is coming up uh, again on Saturday. But just thinking about the whole like DJing journey outside of work and stuff and the things I've been doing, even with the podcast and whatever it may be. And just thinking about, you know, when I first kind of start, got started DJing, especially when I was doing nights in Dawson a few years ago, like five or six years ago, when that whole scene was kind of really bubbling up and I played quite a big role in, you know, in kind of shaping the sound, shaping the kind of parties that were going on around that time. Um, I didn't really have that many lofty goals, but the loftiest goal I might have had was to kind of become a, like a big part of that scene, right? To be like the kind of, you know, one of the main pillars and the rocks in that kind of scene. And that was something that I kind of eventually done and achieved. And I was very happy I did so. But then whilst I was going through that process, I also realized that I kind of was in love with DJing, right? I was in love with this idea of like uh, shaping the sonic landscape of a night out, right? Uh, being in charge of crafting the sound, uh, punters and bar owners and managers, whoever they may be, trusting you enough in order to play um, a, 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 a prolonged set during a, during a night out. And that was something that I always wanted to do, especially since I've been going to places like Berlin and Frankfurt and other places in the UK to go and club and party. I kind of fell in love with that whole culture, but I fell in love with the actual true essence of DJing, which kind of relied on up and coming DJs, finding a residency somewhere in a local bar or pub and being able to kind of learn on a job and grow and develop over the years um, in the hope that you develop a unique sound, a unique taste, a unique point of direction, and that eventually people will trust you and they eventually want to keep coming back and back and back to the bar. And um, that's something I wanted to do. So in, in between that whole time of me kind of hanging out in Dawson and doing all that sort of stuff, I kind of took a, a bit of a, I wouldn't say it was a brave decision, but I did something that was, might have been counterintuitive because I'm not sure how brave it was, but I guess it was counterintuitive, right? Because I was, you know, I was very popular in that scene. I was, I was somebody that a lot of people knew. I knew a lot of people. I was attending loads of parties. I was going to all the gallery events and going to all the store launches and doing all the kind of networking things that people do nowadays. And I was doing that really well whilst maintaining my um, 
dignity, right? Not selling myself out, not pretending to be something else I'm not, and just kind of, you know, being the best version of, my, of myself in front of other people and hoping that that kind of energy will kind of resonate with people and they want me around more. And that you've worked for a period of time. But then I noticed that I went into heading this direction of actually uh, trying to be a good DJ and develop into being an actual uh, paid professional DJ that was kind of hired to go and play at festivals and one of the, one of the famous bars and the nightclubs all around the world, right? And I wanted to do that, but I wanted to do it in the kind of in the right way, in a way that I've kind of seen my uh, kind of, you know, forefathers and four si- and four mothers, whatever they come, came before me doing it, right? And that was by crafting it from the from the bottom all the way to the top, get myself in the mud, starting from residencies. And that required me having to kind of pull away from that scene, right? And then kind of just earn my keep DJing in like shitty bars and pubs, quote unquote, and hoping that over a long period of time, I'll be able to kind of slowly but surely work myself back up again. Um, and then I'll be able to kind of to command a, maybe a better fee. I'll be able to command a better selection of places to play at. I'll be able to command better attention, whatever it may be, right? That would kind of be the way to do it. So I decided to pull myself away, but it also coincided. I'm not going to, I don't want to give myself too much credit. I think it also coincided with my kind of star dimming a little bit in that scene too, right? Because, you know, it's a trend. It's kind of a hipster. It's a hipster scene for the most part. And if hipster them as told as anything, it's quite fleeting, right? Um, the whole point of being a hipster is that you jump on things from time to time, right? You one time you're all about this thing, next time you're all about this other thing. That's the whole point about being hipsters, right? But it's a it's a collective movement. So naturally, with that collective movement, there's an there's an inf- there's an influx of new people coming in all the time, right? Because they're discovering this new scene and saying, "Oh, wow, it's cool to hang out in Dawson. Wow, it's cool to do this. It's cool to put on your own parties. Wow, it's cool to DJ them. It's cool to design the flyer." You know, there's things that are happening, and everyone's kind of going in. And then obviously, for the people that like me, who's been in the scene for a while. Um, you then start to get other opportunities or you start to move on a little bit. So you kind of, you know, as we're going out, people are coming in. But if you're going to stay in there, you have to also know that you're competing with these new forms of energy, these new kids that are coming in with like this drive to really, really do something. And you're consistently having to be on top of things. And then I, I realized that once I was not interested in being that, and also my style was dimming anyway because I was having to reprove myself in front of a whole new audience, um, it only made sense for me to kind of pull away. Now, again, I could have said, you know, that was a dent to my ego. I didn't feel like I was I was getting a credit I deserved, which is not true whatsoever. Cause I don't really have that kind of sense of ego for myself. But instead of having that point of view, I decided to direct all that energy into trying to, you know, again, build my DJing career up from the ground up, from going to bars and pubs around the area, and then slowly but surely working my way up in the hope that my music, the way that I played, would kind of propel me forward, right? And I knew, of course, if ever come, if came a time for me to come on camera or to speak for myself, I knew I had the chops to do that, but I need to be able to kind of get that skill down. And of course, along the way, you know, as this, as this kind of passage says, you know, choosing your own path and just sticking with it and hoping that it's going to be okay in the end it's quite hard because you know when when you're especially when you're stuck when you're on social media platforms and you're constantly looking at what people are doing and i've mentioned before like it, as great as it is at all i think sometimes the whole mental health issues that are happening around the scene have a lot to do with this idea that you know social media does level the playing field somewhat it allows me and you to kind of share our designs share our ideas share what we're doing share our inspirations our motivations on social media but it also allows us to kind of compare ourselves to people that we shouldn't probably be comparing ourselves to because they're far ahead of us but on social media we all look the same right because we all got the same buttons to upload we all have the same page layout it's the same so we kind of get this false assumption that somehow we should be doing the thing that they're doing too. You get the FOMO, you get the envy, you get the jealousy and all those things happen at the same time. So it's quite difficult probably to stay on your path if you're that way inclined. But of course, during that time as well, I subconsciously I decided to limit my time on social media. I hardly spend any time on Instagram, if at all. If I am on Instagram, it's, I'm just posting and dumping, right? And that's it. I don't really stay on it to communicate or to like browse and on my discovery page. I don't do that whatsoever. And I'm using those tools as a way to kind of distribute my content and what I'm doing, but I'm not using it to kind of compare and contrast. So it kind of makes things easier. And I guess too, I just have that serenity of thought. I'm just kind of content with what I'm doing. I'm happy with the, I'm happy with going through the process. I'm kind of not ex- attaching any expectation towards it. I'm not kind of like, this is a ride or die thing. And if that doesn't work out, oh my God, my whole world's going to be crushed. I'm just taking every day as it comes. And I think with that, of course, it's very testing and it takes a lot of time and it's something that requires you to really humble yourself. You know, so one one week you're playing in front of three people in a bar. Next week it's like full. Another week it's empty. Another week it's full. Another week it's empty. Another week it's empty, 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 empty. You have to consistently play in front of people who probably don't give a shit that you're there anyway, right? So it's not the most coolest place. You're not playing in, 
you're not doing a car heart launch event somewhere where you get free clothes and you get a canopy and you're playing in front of hipsters and shit no you're playing in front of everyday average folk you probably don't care you're there but you're having to slowly but surely earn the right to play and then eventually you're going to get better and i think i have got better and one of the things that was quite warming was that this week i received quite a nice email from a former um bar manager where i used to dj who's now moved on to another bar and just i got an email the blues just emailed me like hey i actually hope you're well duh, duh, duh. I'm just to let you know that I've moved to this new bar and we're actually um, thinking about introducing DJs to the bar. So we wanted to kind of get you in if you're interested. And she offered me a couple of dates with some more dates happening in the future. And it's like, wow. Do you know what I mean? Like, and that kind of, again, if that didn't happen, it, it still, it wouldn't kind of bum me out. But it's quite nice to get these little signs from the universe, whatever you may call it, and higher power, whatever, letting you know that you're on the right path, that you're doing the right thing, that what you're doing is probably going to get you where you want to get to in the end. Again, it's a tiny thing. It's not like somebody emailed me and told me, oh, I actually wanted to play at the Bergheim right tomorrow, which would be fucking amazing. But it's just that recognition of like, you know, you're playing in a bar, in a pub in these places, and normally, you know, at that level... I'd, I'd kind of equate it to probably open mic level, right? It's probably a, you know, it's a flick of a coin if that person's going to be good or not. They might be complete garbage. They might actually um, chase punters away because I've seen it happen before where people will come into a fairly quiet pub. They'll have to DJ and they'll be playing fucking electro house from like 8 p.m. onwards. And it's like, hey, dudes, like, come on, just relax. Lower the volume a little bit. Play something that fits the tone of the, air, uh, of the space a little bit more and then go from there. So it's quite nice to hear... Um, to kind of get a recognition, especially from bar managers who are in that place all the time, saying that, you know what, I'm in this space a lot, eight, more than eight hours a day, but I think you are good at kind of playing for that kind of environment of that, that kind of crowd. And now have the opportunity potentially to be playing in uh, a bar in Dawson. So um, that's going to be sorted out in the next few weeks. So when I have details, I'll announce that. But it's interesting how it's all come back 360, right? So I kind of, you know, it, it purposely took myself out of the equation because I thought, you know, I wanted to earn my keep the right way. I probably wasn't going to be the cool guy anymore. I had to accept that and then kind of did it the kind of from the ground up. And now, look, it's all come back around again. Now I'm back in that space where it, technically I wasn't deemed cool enough for that respect. But, and even the cool enough thing, I think it's fine as well. If you want to be that socialite hipster person, I think it's perfectly fine. But you just have to understand the work that's involved in it. Uh, during my... um during my heyday when i was like kind of one of the main people in that scene i was out thursday to sunday every single week now i don't know how i afforded it to be honest or whatever but i was out every single day thursday to sunday continuously sometimes even wednesdays right depending if the alibi had karaoke or something right during the week sometimes even yeah sometimes even even on a monday you take a break tuesday and you come back again on thursday or wednesday and thursday so I was consistently out. I was consistently um, look adding people on Facebook, talking to people on social media, um, sharing stuff on social, funny stuff that you saw, articles that you read, commenting on other things. Like consistently around, like consistently, consistently, consistently around. It's it's tiring, man. It takes a lot out of you. Um, not on top of like you know making sure you look good, making sure you have all the right outfits, the correct thing. Again, it's not so, it's not something you do consciously, but when, once you're when you're in that kind of bubble of like hipster cool scene, you have to. There's things that you have to kind of that you subconsciously do or unconsciously do without realizing that are kind of done in the hope of kind of solidifying your position and kind of making sure that you're kind of one of the main people. People regard you as like you know one of the peers inside the group. Um, so that was quite tiring. And again, it's something that I don't think I could do now. I just don't have the patience to do it. And I just think as well, um, considering the amount of experience that I have, um, I just think that's not my role now. I think I need to free up the room for the kids coming up who are wanting to kind of make a name for themselves so they can kind of make their mistakes in their own safe spaces. And I can go off and do my thing. That's kind of how the evolution could be, right? Um, no one ever wants to be the 40-year-old um, in a nightclub, right? Especially when you're in a nightclub full of other kids that are like under 21 it's all well and good being a nightclub full of other 35 and and plus year olds but trying to remain to be the cool guy in that sort of space is a bit cringy i never wanted to be that guy there's too many examples of that in the scene that's something i didn't want to do so um yeah just something i thought i'd share on the back of reading the daily stoic you know um trust in the process uh stick to your own path um and yeah and hope and hope that that's going to get you where you want to get to and again like i said um the universe has a weird way of kind of giving you little messages giving you little signs that tells you you know just stick on stick on this path and everything will be okay and that is where i am at the moment so yeah um going back to dawson again soon dj that's gonna be fucking interesting absolutely interesting Woo! anyway let's get into some topics here that i have listed on the old um, notifying apps well, I wrote something then and I didn't finish it. Imagine when you write something, you don't finish it. What the, what that means? I don't know. Who knows? Anyway, number one, 
topic here uh, talking about djs talking about djing culture i've got here scream mr scream of dubstep fame we all remember scream right scream during the whole dubstep scene when i was popping off him screaming benga and a few others were kind of the forerunners in kind of you know really spreading that dubstep sound and taking it global um scream was one of the only few people i think in that scene too that really pivoted a lot someone i kind of again saw kind of inspiration from as well because he completely pivoted away from dubstep um and decided to kind of reinvent himself without changing his name which was an interesting decision to make and kind of went to earn his stripes of being a, just a really good dj and i saw him on some really it was really interesting when that happened because whenever you saw scream's name on a lineup of, of dj flyers it was always with like really established house techno uh, disco people and he didn't really make any sense what was going on but then i think i first heard a, a mix of his i think he might have been playing loads of future boogie tracks or somebody else some other label but i remember hearing one of the first mixes with him i was like oh wow now i get it like he was really trying to earn his keep just being a good dj and i guess you know coming from that background of dubstep or coming from that background that he did anyway um and just being technically proficient at djing i think there is an idea in it that you kind of do have an interesting take on how to kind of play those sounds because of the experience that you have playing those kind of high octane sets with your kind of spreading your arms around i'm pretty sure there's there's some skills that can be implemented into the sets that he's doing now and i just think it's interesting just to see how he's kind of gone about shifting um himself within the kind of electronic landscape and there's a really good interview with him now at the moment on mix mag magazine or mix mag dot net which i recommend you check out one of my kind of uh, main places i go to kind of um get any news on terms of electronic music what's happening on the scene overall uh, he's got one um quote here that i think was quite interesting that i'm gonna quickly scroll down here and show you do, 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 which i think something we could all kind of live by right um on getting on with people quite here at the bottom so he says uh do you, i've only ever had one aim really uh don't be a cunt i've grown up around a lot of different people i know i know when someone's being a cunt and i don't want to be that that's kind of really sage advice right that's you can't really begrudge that kind of advice like don't be a cunt and we've all been in spaces where you've been with people or you've been around people especially people that have any sort of notoriety or any kind of name attached to them and they go out their way to kind of really you know be unpleasant and sometimes you sometimes i know for me i wonder if like for that person that default um action of being a complete cunt or a dick it just comes normal to them or if they're considering having to try because i know for me in my own personal experience trying to hold a grudge or remembering someone you don't like and then when you see them scrunching your face up or just being a dick consistently for more than 10 minutes it just requires a lot of energy it requires you to remember why you're being a dick so that you're constantly getting yourself riled up and angry right i don't necessarily think i could have that as a default emotion so that'd be something that i kind of trigger so for me it's you know it's something i find quite tiring and i personally wouldn't want to do but i know for some people they find it quite liberating being a dickhead but for me i just think you know the short space of time we have available on this planet and the fact that we all have to rely on interpersonal communication and contact with other human beings to, in order to help us get forward in life whatever that we're doing regardless of how independent we might think we are the least you can do if you're going to have to rely on others and you have to be a, a kind of um what you might call it uh a bastion for good relationships just try not to be a cunt you know try not to be a dickhead try not to have people speak ill of you especially intentionally right especially because something you did intentionally something you did unintentionally fair enough you can't control that but there's no need i think nowadays to do that um and i'm, it's, I'm glad to see someone like scream who probably has more excuse than anyone to be a fucking cunt is um not doing that and this is again uh there's a lot of pieces of in really good stage advice and in interview that i recommend you check out but it's available now on mix my magazine i thought i'd quickly mentioned it so i scream the wisdom of scream on mix mags magazine da, 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 da. next on the list here we have ba, 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 di, ba, di, ba, ba, di, ba. oh ambush keychains yes we do have ambush keychains so um yoon from ambush frame is um going in hard with the accessories i think she did a couple of pieces for dior didn't she right helping out um kim jones there at dior but i thought these look pretty cool um just in terms of you know djing wise i've been using at the moment a couple of toshiba one that i've lost and another samsung another philips and usb and i've kind of realized that regardless of because they're both usb c 2.0 but i think i've read on stuff online that um I, it depends on this i don't know what what the what the thing is but the the specs are similar but the downloading speeds or the speeds that i kind of have to extract playlists from from my um usb don't really work that well 
and um and just in general in terms of carrying them you know sometimes when i'm djing i might take a little small pouch with me that i have here actually like a little bum bag hit bag thing that i usually might put some of my um, headphones in with maybe my couple of usb sticks in there uh but i kind of want something maybe a little bit more interesting you know just to kind of spruce it up a little bit and i saw uh i did see one that i think it might have been better more somebody else made it made like in the sort of like a crucifix shape right so a kind of usb stick in a kind of um sterling silver crucifix where you can kind of pull it out and then um and now i've seen this from ambush which is sort of uh, essentially like a gold and silver was it sterling silver uh usb keys i'm assuming one's gold plate and one's just regular silver and these look really cool i wonder how much they're going to be when they when they launch but i'll gladly take a pair actually so the kind of necklaces that you put around your neck i'm not sure what the tips are going to be if there's going to be lids on the cup on the usb cut on the usb uh connector bit i'm sure there will be little lids in it but what they'll look like if it would be like a, so, a particular sort of motive of shape but i, I quite like the look look of these probably might replace the chain with something else um maybe a little bit more thick a bit more substantial but it's something i've been interested in seeing like how um technology companies use kind of wearables or jewelry accessories that kind of incorporate stuff like usb keys especially in dj world i assume a lot of people are kind of like me and kind of want something a little bit more interesting than carrying shit in a side bag overall but yeah i thought these look pretty cool um so these are uh autumn winter 19 uh sterling silver usb necklaces from ambush so check those out if you want and if you have any suggestions of anyone else that's doing those kind of things that i can purchase now let me know um what else is on here um aries and jeremy diller okay this is another one as well some a brand i've kind of spoken about i think before here isn't it, on the podcast um aries or rise have done some quite interesting cool stuff they've kind of started out being f mainly um female based and then they kind of branched out into doing a lot of men stuff um one half of the partnership used to uh it's ferg who kind of helped out off regadelic or ferg delicious or whatever how you pronounce his name he's one of the um art directors who kind of contributed to um, palace and what they kind of do if i'm if i'm not mistaken i'm pretty sure he's the guy that or might be will bankhead who, who actually made the trifecta uh triangle that they kind of use as their logo it might be world bankhead i'm not too sure which one it is but regardless um arise is really one of my kind of favorite kind of brands to kind of watch out for if you want a brand that's sort of similar to brain dead but it's uk based and kind of has a little bit of a um a little bit a little bit more of a let's say sexual vibe towards it. you know brain dead is probably a little bit musty and boyish and just you know you can just imagine a kid in his room with a room covered in posters with all the old school computer games around him i'd say aries is a little bit more it has a little bit more of a sexual vibe to it um there's some there there are some floral patterns to it there are some nice shirtings some nice details on the pocket some nice white pants it's got a little bit more of a femininity towards it which might kind of lend itself to the fact that it started off being a women's brand in the beginning but they've now collaborated with one of my favorite contemporary artists jeremy diller who was um a turner prize winner back in the day someone who kind of did get me thinking about whether or not i went to win the turner prize in the um in the future but again one of my favorite contemporary artists out just in terms of just the way he carries himself the artwork that he does the way he speaks and lectures and presentation i would definitely recommend you check some of that some of the stuff that he's done out um and they've done and they've done basically a, a capsule collection and a, and a ex exhibition that's all to um, that's all encompassing something that i'm probably gonna have to check out when this launches um so we've got here on hype beast um they they launch here put it up on so jeremy did celebrate britain's neolithic history with a new capsule collection um it's going through the pages so they've got hats and t-shirts which look really cool uh paleolithic snapback hats here they've got nice sort of bum bags and cellar tape and phone covers great little hoodies again i just think they make really cool stuff anywhere areas and collaboration with jeremy did are probably even better um some nice t-shirts i think will be quite popular i love the <laughs> i love the t-shirts with the kind of paleolithic um illustrations on the front they've got these really cool arise and pagan shirts and stonehenge t-shirts as well look really amazing um again just really nice detail stuff a lot of the smiley face stuff which has been very trendy for the past few seasons i think so far a lot of companies have kind of done them more specifically like cactus flea flea plow market and obviously it's like rocky's kind of incorporated it a lot in his stuff and obviously capital has done loads of stuff on, on their side of it mostly taking inspiration from the kind of like uh rave cultures of the 80s and stuff that was something that was prominent during those times so if you're kind of not familiar with that that might tie in with a lot of the stuff that we're seeing now on the runway in terms of the 90s sort of like retro feel but a lot of that smiley faces comes from that kind of rave culture scene um so you're seeing a lot of that species coming in now and yeah in general just a really really strong collection 
I think so. I'm not really sure about this logo, though. It looks a little bit more like a penis than it does a bone, which I'm assuming that's what it's meant to look like. But it does look a bit questionable. Walking in without a new T-shirt, I'm sure the banter boys will be loving it. Again, just just, just, just um, really good teeth. I really love this T-shirt, actually. Stonehenge English teeth. I think that looks fucking awesome. There's actually a quite a good picture of ASAP Rocky on his tour, Indian Generation, wearing like a, a ski mask with like gold, and he's got a ski mask covering his eyes and everything. And he's got like gold um, grills on. It looks really eerily quite cool. They should definitely put that on a t-shirt if they haven't already. Um, again, tie-dye, of course, tying into what everyone else is doing now. I really like the shape of this um, tote bag, which is sort of like an O shape on a strap, which is very interesting. We've got an interesting, actually, uh, tag motif here at the bottom. Um, we don't see that much often these days, do you, in streetwear pieces? It's something that kind of was permanent in Japanese streetwear. I think it's something that Hiroshi Fujiwara actually invented, the whole like little label on the side of the sleeve here. Um, but we've got something similar to that on the on this collaboration, but it's instead of putting up on the bottom hem of the T-shirt, which looks quite interesting, like a little pull tab. Um, and again, this Wiltshire Before Christ um, jumpers are really nice. The shape looks really nice as well, similar to the kind of retrofit sweats you might have seen of late college sweatshirts, not Wranglands, sleeve too so you get a nice boxy shape that a lot of people want nowadays with their sweatshirts and again just an interesting collaboration i think overall um it launches when does it say here it's a 30 piece collection uh when they're gonna launch it exhibition is set to open on in the london store the, the london store x on january 16th which is tomorrow and will run until Sunday the 27th. The company capsule release at Aries Web Store and Dover Street Market locations around the around the world on January 18th. So that should be quite cool. So yeah, so this exhibition is happening from tomorrow onwards. Opening times 12 p.m. till 7 at 108 The Strand. So it's uh, Jeremy Diller and David Sims in collaboration with Aries, right? No, Aries, Jeremy Diller, David Sims and Store X Presents. Uh, Wiltshire Before Christ. So check that out if you haven't already. What else is next on the list? Da, 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 da. What got here? Uh, Kevin Hart, when apology isn't enough. Well, this has probably been spoken about already enough as it is, but I just thought I'd lend a little um, couple, uh, two cents on it. Of course, everyone's already aware of what's happened with Kevin Hart regarding with the Oscars and his apology, non-apology, and his subsequent walking away from hosting the awards. It's been something I've kind of been interesting into watching because, you know, I think specifically it being a Kevin Hart issue because Kevin Hart's probably one of the only celebrities probably prior to his um, extra marriageable affairs or whatever he was doing outside of that when he got caught red-handed there. But I think out, before that, he seemed like the, the one person in Hollywood, maybe The Rock, uh, is somebody that kind of maybe contest him in that regard especially since um vin diesel kind of uh fell down in everyone's good graces when he kind of freaked out and shit with the whole the rock um getting his whole spin off no is it vin diesel no it was it was um it wasn't vin diesel what was his name anyway vin diesel was another person but i'd say the rock and kevin hart are probably two of the most you know well liked people in hollywood so i was very interested to see how the outrage mob how the social justice warriors would kind of go about um tearing down kevin hart as somebody who was kind of beloved amongst most people and um, it was quite an interesting um, affair overall. Number one, I think most, even the biggest Kevin Hart fans, I probably don't think they would have remembered those tweets that he sent out that long ago, 10 years ago, um, kind of, you know, expunging on some of the bits that he'd done in his earlier specials where he said, you know, if you if your child was gay, he'd beat him over the head with something with a toe or something. I think it was a kind of theme that he'd done in his earlier work. It's crass. It probably is a bit tone deaf regarding where we are now in society. But, you know, again, it's a joke. It's a comedian. Um I don't think necessarily you should take that as um, his declaration of what he would actually do if he encountered somebody that was gay in his family. Um, so I didn't necessarily think it was something even worth apologizing for. But again, you know, outrage mob come out and they kind of banish you. But you just to see what happened was once he did apologize, it just didn't stop. It wasn't that he would apologize and it was over. When he didn't apologize, all of a sudden, uh, Dom Lemon, um, a CNN, a, like news, well, I wouldn't even call him a, a news host or anything because he he definitely gives more of his opinion and actually just reports on the news but he kind of went at him recently on cnn talking about how he should be an ally to uh, the lgbtq community and then kevin hart came back at him saying that that's not his life's work and that's not something that he wants to do um he just wants to approach his action and continue doing what he wants to do and you know and don lemon being disappointed in that him being a black man blah blah so it kind of got conflated it went from being this issue of kevin hart did this um oopsie and didn't didn't apologize then it went from kevin hart is not apologizing because he hates gay people he finally does apologize he steps away from the oscars then his friend ellen degeneres you know friends in high places decides to have fight for him 
Then on the back of that, Don Lemon replies back and says that that interview was a bit tone deaf. And then they're going back and forth. And it just, it just, the narrative got changed several times. So much, so much so that you're sit, they sat there, left, you're, you're left there thinking, who actually from the LGBT community came out and um, rebuked um, the Oscars or for even h- hiring Kevin Hart? Who, what um, spokesperson that uh, the LGBTQ community largely would agree speaks for their interest? had come out and actually chastised him. I don't think there was any, right? It was all kind of marginal um, people on social media or news outlets that were kind of constantly reporting this and getting those headlines out there again and again and again. And what it proved to me was that regardless of how well-liked you are, no apologies enough. Like, no amount of apologies is ever going to be enough in order to kind of get yourself back in the good graces of people. And now we're kind of seeing that now happening with the whole Louis C.K. thing, right? Um, Louis C.K. came back after his whole episode that happened last year and it seems as if like you know I, i'd maybe do agree that the way he came back into the comedy might have been a bit tone deaf and he didn't necessarily address anything he didn't necessarily speak about it he didn't actually let people know um what kind of path of redemption he went through all those things that people want nowadays he did nothing of it nothing of the sort he kind of just um uh he kind of just turned up at a comedy club one day and asked his manager if he could do a couple of minutes and go up on stage. The guests, the the fans or the people inside the comedy store weren't aware he was coming beforehand and kind of hoped that he could just get back on the saddle and continue. And of course, you know, mostly people didn't like that. So I understand in his point of view, maybe he didn't do it the right way, but we're seeing even the Louis C.K. thing, it being a few times, he's been up a few times now. He said some other controversial things that people don't necessarily like. But it's got to a point now people are starting to see that it's less about Lucy K and what he says and, and how he comes back and more so about these people just don't want you to come back. It's just a, when, when, when they say cancel culture, what they mean is that you're cancelled forever. There is no redemption, which I think is a scary part, right? I think for some people, you know, the Harvey Weinstein's of his world, right? You bury them under the prison, right? No problem. But for some people who do an oopsie right in the in the words of, of pewdiepie who do fuck up who do make a mistake there has to be a path of redemption there has to be a path that you can go on in order to kind of get you back to where you were previously it might take long it might not be how it ever was ever before i'm sure lucy k won't ever be the the celebrity of star that he was of yesteryear right some people just always continually want to remind him of his shortcomings which will eventually put some people off anyway but i'm sure some of his true fans will stay around and i'm sure you know he's lost millions and millions and millions of pounds anyway and his reputation has been damaged throughout this whole time whatever it may be but there has to be a path of redemption if the accusers of the situation who you know the the girls that he did um expose himself to even though he asked for permission which is something that gets lost in the whole story but again maybe that's not even important but if, the, if those women are happy enough to ex, um, uh, forgive him, then shouldn't we as well? Shouldn't we just let, let it go and continue? And same with the Kevin Hart situation, right? If Kevin Hart apologized and walked away from the Oscars and said, you know what, I'm not doing it anymore, should that be enough? What do people, what do people now want from him? Do they want him to completely stop um, performing, completely stop doing any sort of stand-up whatsoever? That is a little bit too crazy. But you're starting to see the the true intentions coming out now. That they want you just to kind of completely disappear forever and ever and ever. And I don't think that is something that's going to be conducive to a good society overall. Again, just something I kind of lend myself to. Just opinions on something I'm not that overly invested in. But it's just to see for it from the outside looking in. You know, Lucy K, who was some, always somebody who was quite opinionated. Always somebody that quite um, divided opinion anyway. Um, his comedy wasn't the most, um, you know, uh, PG friendly for the most part. It's funny to now see those same people who kind of championed him and championed the way he was so vulnerable and so open about his deficiencies to are now coming out and saying that he's a hack and he's tone deaf. It's like, what? Uh, if anyone was, if, if anyone was the opposite of a hack is, is Louis C.K., right? He battles with really, really complex and interesting ideas. And that set I heard last time, especially talking about the Parkland survivors and the way he kind of interpreted how, um, you know, well to do the younger generations nowadays, I thought it was quite genius in that aspect. It might have been a bit rough. It might have been his first time doing it. You know, he hasn't been up on stage a lot because he's been basically absent from comedy for a whole year. And anyone that does comedy, who you might listen to on interviews or podcasts always says you have to continually go up on stage every single day to get better right the moment you take any sort of prolonged time away from it you go back completely to square one or to square zero do you know what i mean you start all, all the way from the beginning again so somebody of his ability and talent however got however talent he may be he still needs to get up on stage so that might have sounded a bit fucked up but you know it's his fourth time on stage effectively um and i'm assuming a lot of other comedy clubs are probably not going to touch him with a barge pole because they don't want the controversy they don't want the outrage from social to come on their clubs want to live a normal peaceful life so 
it will see how it goes on but i want i want to definitely see an evolution of what we're having now cancel culture is still something i'm quite for um i just think you know there probably has been a lot of a lot gone on in yesteryears that has gone unpunished because it's quite hard to prove in a court of law i completely understand that so there has to be other forms of justice especially if it's like you know your community kind of ousting you or you know you're embarrassed in front of your peers i think that's all well and good right that kind of public shaming in that regard is good but there should be a way for me to kind of get back um in your good graces especially if i'm repentful um especially if i if i'm asking for forgiveness and i want to change my ways i think i should be allowed to be given enough rope to come to hang myself or to lift myself up from um the depths of hell that's essentially my opinion on it anyway regardless but yeah inter it's interesting um way we are now um, especially the kevin hart thing like you know no apologies enough and uh, just thinking about the kevin hart situation like he's usually quite beloved isn't it he's somebody that people usually rate and like but it seems like nothing he says is gonna ever 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 be good right um and i wonder what changed there became i wonder where he went from being everyone loved to this is it because of that video of him cheating on his wife um which again is weird because it didn't seem as if like his wife was you know um the most um popular person on social right there's a lot of people on social media who kind of had a lot of bad things to say about kevin hart when he got married to that young lady especially because he left his uh, mother of his children to go um her hook up with um iniko and echo i forgot her name is or something along the lines of so it just seems really funny weird how it went from kevin hart being the person everyone loved to now kevin hart being the social pariah or somebody that cannot do any good right they're always looking to some holes to kind of pick at him uh, and again i'm interested to see how it develops how it goes on because it's gonna be interesting case studies both in both cases of lucy k and kevin hart you know once once you do want once you do want to come back and do what thing you want to do how do i get back on the side or how do i get back on public redemption little by little we will see this and hopefully common sense will prevail hopefully Anyway, um, what's next here? Uh, Fat Man v. Jim White. What was it? Also, this was an argument <laughs> with uh, Neil Custis. Neil Custis um, of Talksport fame. You'd say Talksport and the Sun fame, right? He's famous for uh, the barb that Louis, Louis Van Gaal, former United manager, gave at him when they were doing a press conference and he was going back and forth with the press. And I think uh, Louis Van Gaal referred to Neil Custis as Fat Man. You Fat Man in the back or something along the lines of and um you know everyone kind of laughed at that because you know nil is probably a fat man he would probably uh, he'd probably accept that himself but then that kind of led to a whole challenge that um i think neil custer said he would he would lose a certain amount of weight if man united did a certain amount of points and of course it never happened but he is a quite an interesting and funny character overall and they get into this weird little sparring match or argument on the radio um jim white who's kind of well known for doing the whole transfer things on sky sports news and with the white hair and always talks in really bombastic terms but they get into this weird argument that really doesn't make any sort of sense uh, i'm gonna play a little bit of it at the moment and we just it's just to see how much someone turns so quickly in, a, in an argument how they go from you know being quite civil and stuff and they just completely lose the plot um, I'll play a little bit of it now. The Tottenham press, hang on a second. The Tottenham press officer had uh, stopped questions being fired at Pochettino about speculation regarding Manchester United. And my attitude there was, it, it reminded me vividly of the situation in the White House with CNN's Jim Acosta being stopped by the Trump aide. It shouldn't happen. Imagine that, right? Imagine attributing a press officer telling you you can't ask certain questions about your potential manager moving to another club, right? Because it's taken away from the game, it's a conflict of interest, all that sort of shit. And this numpty on the radio is equating it to the press officer at the White House denying the press the ability to grill the president or to grill the spokesperson in the pulpit. It's just fucking... Honestly, some football people... They take sports way too seriously, right? They try and politicize it. They try and amorphize it. They try whatever it is, right? They're always trying to kind of imbue some sort of social commentary to football. It's not that deep, mate. Right? If the manager is of one club, he's refusing to answer questions about him potentially going to another club. That's a good thing, right? The managers of that club too, or the fans are going to be happy that you're not wasting their entire press junket on asking questions that have nothing to do with their own club. God almighty. And the bottom line is, I think I think we're all culpable in this, you, me and others. I don't think we push hard enough to make ourselves heard at news conferences like that. We should be dragged out kicking and screaming. No, well, you see, but that would be ridiculous. That would make us look ridiculous as well. There's ways to ask questions and there's ways to elicit information and it doesn't necessarily involve people shouting and screaming at people and making a show of it. Now, for you to suggest that's what we should be doing is totally wrong because you have to deal with football clubs, you have to have a relationship with managers. Yeah, I understand that. Same, you can still ask the same question 
and still get the same information by asking it a different way. But no, the, my, <coughs> my point is, Neil, that no, you I don't get you don't get information because they cut you <clears throat> short. No, we do actually, and they don't always. One doesn't and get information you, because one is cut actually, short by a press officer. You, no, but you suggested we weren't asking the right questions, and that if you came up there, you would do it. That's what you said. Now I've been covering this. Do, what did what did you say that if I came up? He didn't say that really, did he? That's what happens when you argue with somebody on a thing. Because I think when you come into an argument with somebody, which when you well, usually when you're arguing with someone, from my experience, arguments don't start from nowhere. There's usually some sort of um, ill will um, that you might have towards the person that is some, maybe something's unsaid, something that you don't even know or is aware of, something that's been lying dormant. And any opportunity or anything that you think that they have said that you feel goes against what you stand for, you'll immediately hear it. Even if that person didn't say it. That's what usually happens in arguments. And they'll just say a point and then stick with it and then start badgering on. Jim White is a nobdy. He's a dickhead. And he does talk out of his ass sometimes. But he didn't say what Neil Custer said. And Neil Custer's interpreted something else. And now we go through the nice bits. Big odd argument. There, I would do that. I didn't say that at all. Yes, you did say that. It's a shame, Neil. You've waited a month and you got it wrong again. Listen, have a good one. Oh! Uh, now Jim leaves the building, and Neil, uh, continue please, uh, Josie. No, I'm uh, not going to continue, I'm not going to continue, not after that, he's so rude. Oh, I'm come on, you're like talking that. to me now, not Jim, alright? We're talking about Josie, <laughs> come on, put the no, ball away, you, come on. What about no, Josie, what's the news? Neil? What? Come on, what's the news? He no, he can't just cut me off like that. And well, off so well he, he has, because he's, he's, on it, he's on it, he's on it, Neil, 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 he's on it, ten. I ring him back, right? Or I'll get him and ring you. I'm not going to ring him back, but he can't dismiss a group of journalists who cover Manchester United. Well, 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 hold on a minute. It's not me. You don't. It's just funny, isn't it? Really. I just, it's just interesting to see how, uh, how, uh, how silly these guys are, especially the sports commentators. Might maybe a lot of it has um is kind of unconsciously a, a kind of reaction to the threat of fan channels and some of these hosts and fan channels going on to present on BBC on BT Sports and Match of the Day and you know lending their opinions on things. Maybe it's to do with that, but you know, or maybe we're now seeing just how silly because you know sometimes I used to listen to talk radio a lot when I was at home. I live at home, talk sport and stuff like that, and you'd hear some of the most balmy shit. Some of it makes sense now, you know, considering they have to cut, they have to fill up twenty four hours worth of airway times, right? You have to. There's going to be times where you're going to talk out of your ass. There's going to be times where you're just going to be, you know, combative for the sake of it. But yeah, these guys are numpties. An argument about nothing. Neil Custis arguing with Jim White about a topic that no one really cared about, and here we go. It just continues on for a good five odd minutes. So if you want to check it out, I recommend you do. It's on YouTube. It's called Neil Custis Crazy Verbal Fight with Jim White um, check it out it's on talk buffet for those of you that like to see these guys argue um, what else is on the list here moving on up oh <clears throat> RA closes comments so this is something that's quite near and dear to my heart um, obviously uh, being a DJ and being someone involved in an electronic music scene um, I've kind of always used um, a resident advisor as my kind of go-to destination for opinion pieces on features, on club reports, event reviews, on um, reviews of albums, EPs, singles, whatever it may be. Anything to do with electronic underground music has been something that I've been kind of going to. And even more so in the last few years, the events, right? Some of the kind of biggest raves I've been to or the best raves I've been to around the world, right? I've been able to buy tickets or kind of locate events I want to attend by using the resident advisor adventure page. It's been fucking amazing amazing one of the best resources out there especially since kind of the facebook events section i used to all kind of use a lot as well but maybe it ties into my kind of um removal from the kind of hipster london scene which kind of you know uh, most of the events were kind of listed on there so when i kind of made my move to kind of go into more club nights and go into more um of these kind of underground electronic events they'd usually go listed on resident advisor and they'd kind of it's an easy way to kind of see the event you can easily browse via the day you can easily browse via the location you can just save um, stuff to your calendar just an easier um, kind of experience of raw and obviously some of the promoters um, tie in ticket sales directly into the app so you don't have to leave it it's all just done really well but one of the parts that's really important about resident advisor on top of all these other things i mentioned was the comment section right and it reminded me a lot of the old school era of um, comments when i used to leave in forums and how they did the comments on resident advisor was very interesting and really cool too it's something i hadn't seen previously essentially they had a forum previously in, in yesterday years which kind of got shut it down and kind of you know um went by the by but they somehow managed to make a way of merging the comments um on the forum with the website so essentially each article each piece of news that's on the that's on um resident advisor whether it be a mix whether it be a feature 
um, wherever it may be, right, or the art of DJing and stuff like that, has is, is essentially a, a a forum topic made by a resident advisor, right? But you know, it's kind of got a skin of a news site. So essentially, any comment left would basically form part of the kind of forum thread, and then the the comments that were left there were left by some of the most intelligent um kind of uh people in the scene overall right who were very invested in kind of sharing their opinion on stuff especially when it came to stuff regarding licensing laws it came to stuff about um female representation it came to stuff about um djing schedules and kind of burnout and that kind of crazy scene when that was kind of happening when people were doing that it came around the whole djing poll thing you get you got some really insightful comments and and, and and kind of insight when it came to those kind of things and one of the other sides of the comments where it really worked really well was the end of year list right and end of year list on reservoirs i've been following for ions right years and years and years was some of the kind of best content out there because they'd review um singles they'd reviews albums end of year list they'll do the best um mixes um loads of things will just be on there and sometimes they'll do the, the best uh polls of djs right dj poll and resident Advisor, which was quite interesting too but the good thing i like about the comments on those end of years things was that you'd sometimes find rare gems that weren't listed on the on the site, right? It, it sparked up so much debate because a lot of the suggestions that are made by an advisor or maybe by their team who are quite well knowledgeable, who've got you know, good experience in journalism, who've kind of imbued in the culture of rule and not people that are coming in from the outside. So they would give their opinion, which then would spark a whole different debate and it would allow you, us, the other the kind of viewer or the kind of you know person that's in the lurches or hiding within the shadows to kind of go about and pick through the comments and find these other releases that you completely miss throughout the year. So the comments was a kind of is always been a bedrock of resident advisor and something that i've kind of always kind of lent myself towards especially when it comes to figuring out if i should go to an event if this dj is good or not blah blah, blah whatever it may be the comments section is one of the main places that i go to and um unfortunately um reservoirs decided to start closing the comments um which has been something that i've kind of i'm completely against and i don't really see the point of um i guess we should have saw the writing on the wall a few weeks ago because um Resident advisors started to close the comments on certain topics because they, from from past experiences, they saw that certain topics um, attracted a user to their platform that they weren't really fond of. Somebody that was quite combative, argumentative, um, saying maybe derogatory things, whatever it may be. But I think that decision to sort of close the comments to certain articles really um, wound me up. Um, especially because it kind of limited the things that you could talk about and it put the power of what you could speak about directly only in the hands of resident advisor, which wasn't the way the resident advisor was kind of marketed towards me or was kind of sold to us in general, right? It was a space that we could all kind of contribute to and that was a fair representation of electronic music, right? We allowed them the journalistic... Um, or what do you call the, the journalistic room, right? In order to kind of uh, speak about, to speak how they wanted to about a certain person, a certain artist, regardless of who it is, without any accusation of payola or whatever it may be that might imbue certain platforms like Pitchfork and stuff like that, right? Um, we kind of trusted that the journalists were kind of um, reporting the news as they saw it through their own lens, right? Um, championing the people that they liked or whatever it may be, but it came from a genuine place. So with that kind of trust that we give the journalists, we were kind of hoping that in exchange, resident advisor will kind of give us, a, allow us a platform and the ability to kind of share our our opinions and our comments in a safe space without the threat of comments being removed or comments being closed if it get if it got a little bit tentative or a bit spicy because sometimes i think in those conflicts in those kind of hurtful comments that might have been developing on the platform i think some of the more interesting suggestions or interesting ideas came from that but unfortunately resident advisor didn't see it that way and decided to close the comments which has been for me, one of the bummiest things about it, because now Resident Advisor just turned into like an aggregator of electronic music uh, news across the interweb, which is fine because it's one place I go to. But part of the reason why people like the site is because of the comments. It kind of goes by and by. Now they've kind of, you know, decided to shift all the comment sections on social media platforms. But for the most part, out, hey, no one's reading Facebook comments, right? It's, it's an, if, if they thought their comments were bad, you, Facebook comments are even worse, right? I think Facebook comments are probably worse than comments you might see on YouTube, right? So it's not really the place to, for really um, good discussion. Um, the website and the kind of forum aspect of it is more because have good, good, uh, good um, discussion. And I think a way to a way to kind of solve this issue would have been for Resident Advisor to take more of a interest or to take more responsibility in terms of moderating the space. It might again, it might be something that had to require getting more people involved and extra kind of responsibilities getting picked up from our members of the team. But from being able to moderate a free space um, site would have been better than completely closing the comments so no one can speak about anything. 
because now we're left with a position where the site is basically rendered null and void for the most part, right? Because part of the reason why an artist would like to get featured on there was to kind of learn what the actual consumers or customers thought about their work, especially the ones that were indifferent. I've, you know, you've, and the ones that who were kind of, you know, up there in the heights, or wherever they may be, could maybe get also a dose of reality of what people are actually speaking about and how they view them as, as artists. Um, there's an article about it here where they kind of speak about it. I'll quickly read a bit, little bit of the section here. Um, our comment section closed today. Here's why. As of today, January 3rd, 2019, users are no longer able to leave comments. This is obviously a big step for us, and here's why we're doing it. RA comments have roots in the 2000s heydays of message boards. Our message boards and our later comment sections were a place for people obsessed with electronic music to share their knowledge, recognition, and general chat. Exactly. Uh, many comments were thoughtful in a way that elevated our comment, our content, and created a sense of community in RA and a global electronic music space all well over. Over time, things have changed. Yes, the whole internet has changed, right? Social media introduced them more broadly accepted way of people to communicate online comment section served an, an, an ever ever smaller portion of the users not just an RA but across the internet which is true right um people are commenting on more different plat on different platforms regularly all the time so maybe the importance of having a comment section on RA isn't important but if anything if more if the general public are swaying towards social media platforms the comment section on RA is going to be even more important because the people who are actually going to be bothering to comment at all are, are going to care if even if it's caring in terms of being a troll or caring in terms of actually sharing insight, they care. The ones in between are just going to go somewhere else. Um, but uh, this might explain why we no longer see our comments as a fair reflection of our audience and or our community. No, I think it is a fair reflection. I think they are a bit. This is where I think delusion is coming in. I think for the good and for the bad. I don't think you could just say because it was just a niche website that wasn't very popular because the genre of music that they were covering wasn't necessarily well accepted within the general zeitgeist or within the general population. Now more and more people are going to festivals. More and more people are attending, uh, are going to places like the Bergheim. You see more and more articles about that kind of thing going around there. So if anything, that kind of scene, that kind of underground music has kind of populated the mainstream. You can only look at venues like Printworks as kind of a good interpretation of that. Right? They've been able to marry the kind of underground and and the kind of overground, the kind of commerciality of a bicep with kind of uh, an underground DJ like Omar S, right? You'll be able to kind of fuse that into one space. So with that, you're going to get obviously um, an influx of different people coming in and sharing their opinion. But again, I think it's a, it's the responsibility of the space or the platform to kind of moderate the space and mold what the kind of tone of voice or kind of comments that you want to introduce in there. But saying that um, because other people are coming in and, and talking rubbish on the platform's reason we're going to close it down regardless, you're kind of um, hurting the small majority of us who are sharing insightful comments just because a small, uh, you know, a tiny minority of people are decided to be out there in the, in the sticks trolling. And that happens everywhere on social media platforms. Everyone trolls. Um, this, uh, too often a tone of disrespect prevails, occasionally boiling into of, into full-blown intolerance, sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, you name it. Of course, but it happens everywhere on social media. Everyone's saying this, right? When people say they get death threats on social media, celebrities and stuff, and they cry about it on TV, it's always funny because essentially death threats happen to everyone, right? Everyone's, in a, especially popular people, you go through their comment section and you'll see someone saying, oh, you should go kill yourself. That isn't necessarily a reflection on that person's thoughts or essentially what they want to do to that person, but it's just a way of trolling. It's, just, it's annoying. It's really something that I'm not really a fan of, but it's part and parcel of the internet that we're living in now. There's a certain subject, a certain segment of the internet um, user base who know that if they say something really inflammatory, it's going to get everyone's uh, panties in a twist. Everyone's going to get hot and bothered about it, and they're going to continue wind people up if they continue going for it. So the more that we react to it, the more that we do these kind of things, the more they're going to rank it up. Um... The, 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 um, to highlight just one part of the issue, by now any comment involving women is likely to receive sexist comments, which again, I'm glad they said that. Now, part of the reason why they decided to close, I think the show that broke the comments back was this um, young lady's feature that I saw for, on the podcast, right? But this I thought was quite justified, the kind of backlash that she received on here, right? So there was a, a Resin Advisor mix series that went up recently, right? With this lady called Mama Snake, right? This is her, right? Is the card the comments still going to be up there or did they delete the comments? There we go. So, this lady called Mama Snake recently had an interview, um, a, 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 you know, RA mix series on Resident Advisor. Resident Advisor mix series is probably one of the most prestigious mix series out there. Once an artist gets featured on here, you know, your career can go kaboomy, right? Especially since they decided to close the RA poll. Again, that's another point of contention for the RA. Resident Advisor. You're, you're going to close the DJ polls for a myriad of reasons I'll kind of go come on to later for another subject. Something I totally didn't agree with because, again, 
being an avid RA fan and being a fan of electronic music and DJs the world over, the RA poll was not only an opportunity for me to champion the people that I loved, but also an opportunity for me to discover other DJs who I had no idea about because the whole premise around it was that people on the user or people on the app or that user website could vote for the DJs they saw through the events they found on Resident Advisor, right? So you got to actually promote and champion DJs that you were probably uh, well deserving of it. People like DJ Tennis, people like, um, um, who else was it? A few others as well had discovered on there um, through that kind of basis. I think even most City Drum Ensemble, some of the DJ had discovered it through that discovery because it was something that was championed by the community by and large. And even someone like um, like even Dixon now, he's probably kind of benefited a lot from it. So they closed the DJ poll for a number of reasons, maybe tie in with the, with the, with the industry, maybe labels or gaming the system and using it as a way to kind of maybe uh, get their aid, get their DJs on their roster or if agencies to get some of their clients to come up and get higher fees, whatever it may be. It kind of got gamed, but again they completely removed it which i completely don't agree with again and then now they can remove the comments but they removed the comments because i think the, the show that brought the cameras back was this um feature with mama snake and she gets a mixed series right you get given this amazing chance to kind of you know share your musical taste and kind of promote yourself in the hope that maybe you're going to increase your profile and again it's just a privilege right to have this opportunity to get this mixed series on a resident advisor and what they do with the mix series that they have an accompanying interview, which is fairly, you know, innocuous and pretty surface, but is an opportunity again for the DJ themselves to kind of, you know, share a bit about their personality, a bit of their journey, a bit of inspiration behind the mix. But it's not necessarily a chance to kind of politicize yourself or to kind of, you know, twist the conversation into kind of some sort of ideologically based political message, right? But somehow this Mama Snake woman suddenly did that and the comment section turned because it, it, seemed, it, it, seemed, it seemed disingenuous. It didn't seem like it came from a real place. It seemed that like she got an opportunity to stand on her soapbox and she immediately used it to kind of for, uh, to kind of push forward her political message. And it took, it took completely away from the mix because I didn't listen to the mix because of the whole, you know, politicized nature of this, of this article. And I think RA had a responsibility to say that you know, if you're going to come out and say these kind of things, right, and stand for these sort of things, especially in electronic music, I think similar to like sports or similar to, yeah, most hobbies people have, it's a sense of escapism, right? You don't necessarily want to go there and start fighting battles that the average general focus fighter, because by and large, you know, the ideas around women, the ideas around people of certain uh, sexual orientations, people of different races and creeds, is quite progressive in electronic music, right? You're not fighting the same fight that you're fighting in your neighborhood, um, wherever you may live in your country countries if it's maybe um, quite conservative in the electronic music space you're not fighting that same fight because it's quite an inclusive space so to kind of forward that message and put that out there doesn't really make any sense but i think this is why they kind of decided to kind of close the section so there's a bit in this interview where she's completely talking right um so it starts off this this interview starts off right what have you been up to recently and then uh mama snake answers setting into a new way of life with a full-time job less going out and more moving around in areas beyond music it's a puzzle right now figuring out which things to be involved in and what to let go of in order to have the capacity to do the things that feel right right and then the second the second paragraph the white heterosexual male dominated world we live in still makes me pretty tired is and is the case and is the cause of a lot of debates among my friends there's no resent but obviously still relevant and something i want to address which isn't very easy in the context of putting out this mix but hwfg i'm not sure what that stands for the logistic things anyone who is not straight white guy still has to put up with are unreal the excuses for not working towards a more inclusive world paying attention to one's own privileges especially music industry are old school outdated and fucking ridiculous it's still permitted by by privileged blindness which i find frustrating recently i've become a bit better at staying with the uncomfortable awkwardness that arises when you speak up for instance when someone says something like we book quality of agenda or it's not to be sexist racist or homophobic we're good people with good intentions but we have to sell tickets to follow the hype blah 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 and so on the list examples is endless it's hard to have these conversations many people head straight into defense mode and then nothing changes it's hard to make someone engage in change when they believe they do nothing wrong not listening to and not giving voice to those who are massively underrepresented remains an issue as a result now again that question in the essentially for it's a dj mix right it's dj mix interview the question is what have you been up to recently and suddenly we get 500 or so words of her political diatribe, right? Most of it full of, you know, um, uh, anecdotal evidence that has no basis in any sort of truth or fact. Some opinions that I completely don't agree with whatsoever. But the person, Arizona Vice just asked her, what have you been up to recently? What have you been up to? 
and we suddenly went into this completely weird virtue signaling message that again no one is really contending to no one's really saying that she's wrong even though i think she's wrong it's not really a fight that we want to fight in this electronic space we get it we know we, we know we got to do things better but what is this what is what is she talking about what is she talking about and then of course the comment sections kind of reflected it and one of the kind of highest rated comments on here um was um where is it there, there's quite a high well i think maybe they'd leak them so you can't really see it but one of the highest rated comments on here kind of called her out for it right um essentially she kind of you know used the opportunity to kind of again just be politicized for, for no how, how reason it doesn't make any sort of sense right and now we don't have the beauty of understanding or going through again you see some background which completely makes sense and we don't have the ability to kind of communicate or to you know our, um intelligently articulate or argue the points that she's kind of addressing on there because she did throw a lot of people under the bus right and no one gets a chance to debate now the comments are completely closed because she probably got her panties in the twist or her agency didn't like the way that she was being portrayed but again her words weren't twisted right for once it wasn't some it wasn't the agenda of the media platform it was a written interview that she decided to then go in the complete 360 and start flying the virtual signaling flag and the moment she didn't get the response that she wanted on, on the comments which was yes woman go we, we back you people started questioning her and even i think i actually made a comment something along the lines of like you know the mix was quite good but I, I completely didn't understand how she went from that question away to that answer. And it completely tainted the way I looked at the mix because it's like, I, well, what, what, why am I now being shouted at? Why am I now being, being a, giving a lecture about inclusivity? It doesn't make any sort of sense whatsoever. Like, it was, just, it was a completely weird situation. And again, comment sections got closed and now, in situation, and now we're in a situation that, that we're in now where resident advisors think the best way to kind of deal with this is to kind of make sure the comments are closed so no one gets their feelings hurt. And again, I just don't, I don't see the, like, it's already a niche industry. It's already a niche scene. Most of, for most of the time, whenever I'm going to these parties, I am kind of attending the party on my own, right? I'm actually going to places and experiences spaces with maybe a three or, three or four people who have necessarily like that kind of sound. The only opportunity where you have to have a kind of community or feel like you're involved is the comment section, right? That's a way to, to discover new artists or to kind of um, get recommendations of things. The people that I've met in the comment section have kind of, I've gone on to become my Facebook friends who I kind of communicate with sometimes on a weekly basis, kind of sharing recommendations on songs and stuff. Like people that I've met when I went on holiday and things as well on, on that instance. Now it's completely been cut out. That kind of discoverability and that communication completely cut out because they don't, they can't handle the comments that are coming in from people who don't necessarily get why they're allowing people just to say whatever they want in that regard, right? Which is fair enough, you can say it, but they're not allowing people to kind of reply and kind of question them or call them out on their bullshit. It doesn't make any sort of sense. It's kind of, it, it's a bizarre, it's honestly, it's a really, really bizarre uh, place that we're in now at the moment. Um, again, um, the article continues, it kind of explains where they are now at the moment. Um, so, uh, it hurts us personally and undermines the value of the acceptance that RA tries to champion more than anything. It's clear that our comments are no longer serving the community in a way that we intended reasons uh, enough to choose, close them. We're extremely grateful to anyone who has left thoughtful comments on RA over the years. You extended, expanded our musical knowledge, offered valuable perspective to our news and features and reviews, and it must be said, never let slip by our notice. We thank you for that and look forward to continuing conversations on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. It's kind of crazy, man. It's kind of crazy. Honestly, it's kind of crazy. Um, so now we don't have any comments, which is part of the main reason why you'd want to um, use a platform like Resident Advisor. And again, I just don't agree with it. I think there was better ways to solve it, whether it was more moderation, um, whether it was a code of conduct that might have gone out as a feature, whether it's, again, just, just accepting that for all the kind of championing rah rah i love he or she dj you are going to get people who are not going to be fans of them or you are going to get people that are going to call out so and so for their political opinions like some people do say some of the most crazy i think it might be a guy called gerard he says some madness stuff on twitter on social media if you might have seen it he's proper proper black lives matter i think it might be a guy called gerard i think so i think it's him he has some really crazy shit that he says so if he got, if he has a feature on art resident advisor and he's spewing his stuff that you know some people might it might um say is crazy I think he should be given, it should be expected that people are, there's going to be some people out there who aren't going to necessarily agree and would want to kind of argue his points and to kind of completely stop that conversation because you don't want to get that person's feelings hurt or you don't want to have a platform where people are of dissenting voices are being able to speak openly and freely is, is goes against everything electronic music stands for, right? Not everyone that's, I, I'd assume not everyone that's in a space like the Bergenhain or sorry, the Bergenhain, the Bergenhain has the most progressive views. Not everyone comes from that certain place, but the whole point of going to the Bergenhain is that we're all united underneath this umbrella of this particular sound, of this particular aesthetic, right? That's what we're kind of, 
uh, all underneath that umbrella we come from all over the world to kind of share in this communal electronic music space and the same can be said for a website now you don't want the opinion to be shared it's ridiculous on top of that we don't have any more ra poll right so the the possibility of championing your djs that you love and support right and giving the opportunity to kind of forward their profile like a like a dixon for instance went from being somebody who was quite well known amongst kind of the heads quote unquote and went to becoming a global superstar so much so that he had to completely change the way he worked he limited the amount of gigs he was doing he completely changed the way he did media the way he did parties it, it may be it let him see even though he might have had ambitions to be the number one DJ, maybe it let him see when he finally did achieve it that maybe it wasn't everything that he wanted. He wanted to do things differently. It completely changed the conversation around what being the big DJ is, right? Especially on the back of the whole Steph Truxler and that whole malarkey when that was happening and the way that they kind of fizzled and burned and rise back up again. And he kind of spoke about the kind of toll it took on his life. So if anything, the DJ poll was a good opportunity for people to see exactly what that number one spot did for some DJs. And also an opportunity for some DJs who were kind of not recognized for their skills and what they were doing and had to kind of um, go into producing tracks just to kind of get their profile up again there's so much DJs who have to do that who have to just make music just because they want to get more bookings don't necessarily want to do it um, it allowed them just to concentrate on DJing and now we don't have that ability to do it we don't have the ability to champion DJs that I, that I love like I don't know like a John Rust one of my favourite London DJs out there I don't have the opportunity to kind of keep voting for him, which I did every single year, just because I wanted people to know that this guy, that DJ is in, in around London mostly every weekend and plays a whole breadth of, of music from dubstep to garage to R&B to hip hop. He's one of the best DJs out, especially consistency over the last few years. And I don't have a chance to kind of vote for him and kind of get him more gigs and get and raise his profile. It's just ridiculous. It doesn't make any sort of sense. And mostly based on industry stuff, I'm assuming, right? Some labels are able to game the system. Some DJs are able to kind of cheat code the system, right? And kind of to get their to get themselves forward. Maybe certain things got misconstrued with the idea of being best, right? In a, such a subjective um, world as DJing, whatever it may be. But come on, man. Come on. You take away our DJ poll and now we don't have any comments. Like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, what the fuck is going on? It doesn't make any sort of sense. That's the only thing that's annoying me about this whole thing. It's like, I know there's issues around female representation in electronic music. I know there is, but if anywhere, if any, if ever there was a place that could change it, like within an instant, it's electronic music. But for the most part, right? It's a DIY environment. We have all come to this space through just hacking away at things, right? Discovering things, um, shazamming stuff, recording stuff on YouTube and uploading it, and then having a comment section open, having people speak to you about the chong, and then you're, you're kind of exchanging um recommendations whether it's starting a club night right film representation is not that great in film in music cool start your own club night start your own festival and have the programming lean, lean towards more like discovering new interesting arts whether they be female or male right and champion that and use that as a platform and that's something that we could do in an instant but instead we keep having the same conversations we keep having doing the same thing and then when the conversations get touchy and they get to and they get too confrontational ra closes the comments i just don't understand it and now we don't have, so again, we don't have comments and so we don't have a DJ poll. Now what? It's just turned into like a glorified events page, right? With a few features sprinkled in here or there. It doesn't make any sense, man. It doesn't make any sense. That's the only thing. Again, it's just, it's a, it's a bummer, man. Because now we're going to get all the comments on places like Facebook, which questionable um, comment section in the first place, not a platform that I, I think a lot of people are that comfortable using or sharing their opinions on, on electronic music in the first place, right? On spaces like Twitter, which is again a bit of a cesspool, which again only works because people can be snarky and you know and mean on there. That's the way content works really well on there in that regard. YouTube is just a complete you know wild wild west of a country place, right? They've got depending on what the people are uploading on there. If ever if ever was a place that was safe, it was RA, and now we don't have it. So again, I don't agree with it. I don't know why they did it. They might have their own reasons, but. If anything, I I definitely would suggest that RA kind of reconsider their uh, decision and kind of move it away because I, I'm assuming the traffic is going to be affected a lot by it too. They're removing the comments. 100% they're going to be able to see that because it was a large part of it. I, I don't, um, no amount of subreddits or anything can replace the comment section on RA. It was kind of the mainstay of where we kind of went to. But again, maybe they know more than I do. Maybe they have more um, information on their fingertips than I, but I just don't think it's the right decision to make, especially off the back of that Mama Snake interview. Like everyone has to admit that Mama Snake was fucking bugging out. Like she was bugging out. You get given a, a feature to to promote your to your mix series, and then you suddenly start politicizing your message after someone asks you what you've been up to recently, and the points that you make don't even make any sense. You're talking about living in a male dominated cis male world, right? Um, bemoaning the state of the industry, and there you are, right? A fairly well educated um, white female 
who's being able to i think she's studying a phd and she's a full-time dj like if ever there was a privilege what the fuck you, i mean it's like it just it beggars belief it beggars belief it really does beggars belief but again what do i know but hey um that's probably um the best place to end it right now um we're just over an hour there with the Single show episode number 44 thanks again for tuning in it's been an absolute pleasure to have the company um of your ears and of your eyes and all that malarkey on this hallowed space um as always for information regarding moi check out xnozingo.com for the information there i'm djing this friday um for tapped at tapis in westford Stratford. so check that out and again on saturday at the heath cotton star for my night lab lab and of of course as i mentioned in the beginning of the show i've got some other dates as well planned for the rest of february in dawson too so it's going to be hotting up hotting in very very soon so keep an eye out for that um but again thanks so much for tuning in. it's been a pleasure to have you as my company and i'll see you guys again very very soon peace